Well, it's sunny, but it's cold. It's a cold wind blowing. Linda and I are someplace really special right now. This is the Bear Paw Battlefield. This is where Chief Joseph and the remaining uh, portion of his tribe surrendered up in north central Montana. And we're gonna walk you through it. It's a pretty interesting place. It's a kind of day that's hard to dress for. If you move around, you get hot, and if you stand still, you get cold. <laughs> the events leading up to this battle actually began in the eastern part of Oregon, in the Wallowa Valley. Just a beautiful, beautiful place. The Nez Perce were originally given a reservation there that covered, uh, oh, a huge area. But gold was discovered there, and you know what happens when, when gold is discovered. By, by 1863, their reservation was reduced by 90%. And then gold discoveries kept happening, and pretty soon the Nez Perce were actually forced out of the Wallowa Valley. When they first left the Wallowa Valley, they were about 3,500 in number. But through a series of battles that went from into Idaho and Montana and down into Wyoming and up through Billings, Montana, back up into northern Montana. There were many battles. By the time they got to the Bear Paw Battlefield, they were only about 800 in number, of which only 100 were warriors and the rest were women, children, and elderly. Well, when the Nez Perce got here on September 29th, 1877, they're just 40 miles shy of Canada. And that's where they were hoping to find refuge. They had been on the run for 126 days. They thought they were well ahead of, of Gibbon and his men, and uh, they thought they could take a break, uh, get maybe uh, shoot some buffalo and dry some meat and just prepare for the coming winter. This says Chief Joseph's teepee. And this is the site of where that was. Very few of them had teepees. There was only a few left. They had lost them at the Battle of the Big Hole. And most of the people were just putting up little lean-to shelters or blankets that they threw over the top of bushes, whatever they could find. All they had was blankets. They had also lost many of their horses so many of them had to walk the whole way. Many of them were camped on the flat right here. Over here to the left of the trail is a rifle pit. They dug that with sticks and butcher knives and um, trowel bayonets that they had gotten at the big hole battlefield. That's a big deep hole in the ground. You see, the next morning, one of the Indian warriors showed up on the south side on his horse and he was waving a blanket in the air, which signaled them that the military was about to attack. They only had minutes to prepare. Colonel Miles and 450 men had ridden 260 miles in nine days to get here, pushing all the way. This is the site of Chief Looking Glass's teepee. This is a continuation of the area where they were camped. There was campsites listed on those metal stakes all through here. On the right is another rifle pit. There's one over there too. And one down in here also, where I'm pointing. This is a sacred place. 
Some of the Native Americans of the Nez Perce tribe that were killed in the battle are still buried around here in unmarked graves. This is where the Nez Perce camp came under siege. Yellow Wolf reflects evening and the battle grew less, only occasional shots, soldiers guarding, sitting down, two and two, soldiers all around the camp so that none could escape. It was snowing, the wind was cold. About 450 men, women and children retreated to the north end of the camp. On the flats and the sides of the coolies, the ground became frozen as rain turned to snow and temperatures dropped. A Nez Perce woman recalls, We dig trenches with camas hooks and butcher knives. With pans, we threw out the dirt. We could not do much cooking. Dried meat and some other grub would be handed around. It would be given to the children first. I was three days without food. Children cried with hunger and cold. In the small creek there was water, but we could get to it only at night. This says this is the spot where Looking Glass was killed, Chief Looking Glass. This is the rifle pit down here. Olicott, Lean Elk, and other warriors met the soldiers as they advanced along this bluff. The fighting was intense and made worse by low clouds and drizzle. The army was stopped, but the Nez Perce suffered serious losses as 26 died the first day. On the west edge of the bluff, a marker identifies where Olicott, Joseph's brother, was killed. Across the coulee to the northeast, Lean Elk was mistaken for an enemy in the severe weather and killed by another Nez Perce. His warning to Looking Glass had come true that neither would leave this place. Yellow Wolf remembered October 2nd as the day Chief Looking Glass was killed. He says, some warriors in this pit with him saw at a distance a horseback Indian. One pointed and called to Looking Glass, look, a Sioux. Looking Glass stepped quickly from the pit, stood on the bluff unprotected. A bullet struck his left forehead and he fell back dead. Looking Glass was hopeful help had come from the camp of Sitting Bull in Canada. So Looking Glass was right there in that rifle pit. And that's where he stood up from on this very spot. And this is where he was shot dead. A lot of you uh, have mentioned that, or have said that Linda is Native American. She's not, she's uh, Okinawan. That's like, uh, politically that's Japanese, but they're different than Japanese. <laughs> and Linda's not Okinawan from Okinawa. She's born and raised in Hawaii, as was her mother. Her father came over when he was a young man. That was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> but Mama was born and raised in Hawaii. We've been there for generations. I don't know anything about being Okinawan. <laughs> um, from where we're standing here, it's, uh, it's a spot known as negotiations or, dece or deception. And on the second day, the cavalry, or Joseph, uh, approached the cavalry with a white flag, approached General Miles with a white flag, and they wanted a chance to um, pick up their dead. I think they had lost like, I think 23? 26. 26 uh, Nez Perce, and don't know how many on the uh, cavalry side, but they wanted a chance to pick up their dead and their wounded and, and take care of them. Well, when that was over, um, General Miles called Chief Joseph back and... Placed him in chains. Yeah. So um, they kept him uh, kind of like a hostage. And then the Nez Pierce also had uh, a soldier that they took as a hostage also. And he was allowed uh, free reign to camp. He was allowed to keep his sidearm even. And they gave him blankets and food and took care of him. Well, the thing about the... The cavalry said they wanted to possibly negotiate. It looks as though, looking back, you see General Miles had moved so fast that he got ahead of his 12-pounder cannon, and he was giving a chance for that cannon to catch up. Well, the cannon showed up 
like the next day. And remember all the warriors were out in all these rifle pits on the hillside. And uh, the biggest target was the Nez Perce campsite itself, which is old people and women and children. And that's where they started lobbing artillery shells, exploding, exploding artillery shells into that camp. Not a smooth move, but that's what they did. On the left coulee slope, Moylan recalls, Captain Edward F. Godfrey had his horse killed from under him. The fall stunned him. Trumpeter Thomas Hurwood rode between Godfrey and the Indians. In this gallant attempt to save his officer, Trumpeter Hurwood was wounded. Before you, in the gully draining to Snake Creek, soldiers lay dead or wounded as the evening fell. Roman remembers, those who fell into the hands of the hostiles were not molested otherwise than to be stripped of arms and ammunition. They, the Nez Perce, even gave some of the wounded water after nightfall when it could be done safely. Another account recalls a warrior giving a blanket to a wounded soldier. The U.S. Army's plan was to attack fast. They thought they were going to make a surprise attack, but the... Uh, Nez Pierce Lookout had seen them coming and they were able to rally in time. The army, half they split up and half went down the west side and they stole all the, all the uh, Indians' horses. So the Nez Pierce were not able to get on their horses or escape in any way. They were under siege now. Well, down here is the area Linda was just reading about where there was wounded soldiers that that lay here the first night. Linda and I came here the first time well, when we first moved to Montana and has like 20 years ago or more. And we were here about the same time in the evening and the coyotes started howling. We were here all by ourselves, and what an amazing experience that was. It's nice to come back. I've been back a couple times since, but it's good to remember our history. Right, and so we don't repeat it. That's the idea, and it is a shared history. Much of the initial fighting occurred along this narrow bluff overlooking the Nez Perce camp. Roman recounts, at the south end of the campground, there was a perpendicular bluff that afforded excellent cover. This was instantly occupied by the Nez Perces, who, withholding fire until the 7th Company A and D were within 200 yards, then delivered it with murderous effect. Wherever the Indians heard a voice raised in command, there they at once directed their fire. After retreating, Miles ordered the cavalry to dismount and reinforce Company K. Fire was directed toward the bluff on the west side of the coulee. The Nez Perce held a position of advantage. The 5th Infantry came up and was halted at the crest. Here it was met by a hot fire from the coulee and men and horses began to drop before they could dismount. The Hotchkiss gun was brought up near this location and was soon driven from the position with severe loss to its gunners. Only hand-to-hand -hand combat with units of the U.S. 5th Infantry forced the Nez Perce to yield the high ground. Roman continued, by three o'clock, it was evident that the attack must become a siege. Up here, and up here we're controlled by the Nez Pierce, this hill here, and off through the cut here, down in the coulee, a coulee is a low spot or like a valley or ravine, where you see those cottonwood trees over there, that was the main encampment of the Nez Pierce. and the military was attacking from behind me. They came from that This way. is looking the other way, yeah. Which way, Linda? From that way, I guess. From the south, yeah. Yep. Pretty much the U.S. Army had them completely surrounded. 
So yeah, it was a siege. They could only get water at night, but the problem was the water was freezing. So even that didn't go so well. This is a hastily dug trench where the soldiers that were killed with bat in battle were, were interred for a while. Um, they were buried here during the battle. And they, the army had set up a tent where they were, the surgeon, the army surgeon, surgeon was taking care of the wounded. But the trench here where they buried the, uh, the dead still remains to this day. In 1912, they were disinterred and they were moved to the uh, cemetery at the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Hard to imagine what that was like on, during those days. Well, it seems to me the Army didn't want to be out here doing this and the Nez Pierce didn't want to be running either. They're all pretty much done. The Nez Pierce were hoping to make it into Canada where they, they felt that they could leave all this behind. That, that wasn't true either, but. Today, it's customary when the Native Americans come through, anything they have on them that they considered an item of value, they leave behind uh, in, in memorial. And you can see where the, the Native American children have done the same thing with their toys here. That's what you're looking at. It's things that a person valued when they put it down. October 5th, 1877, at 11 in the morning. With the fighting at a standoff, Chief Joseph met with Colonel Miles near this site. Surrender was a survival strategy to keep the Nez Perce people alive and together. One witness reported that Chief Joseph spoke these words. Tell General Howard I know his heart. What he told me before I have in my heart. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. Looking Glass is dead. Tuhu Kul Kut is dead. The old men are all dead. It is the young men who say yes or no. He who leads the young men is dead. It is cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them, have run away to the hills and have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want time to look for my children and see how many I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. And here in the main campsite, you can see the rocks gathered here from campfire all those years ago. Well, speaking of campsites, Linda and I don't have a clue where we're going to camp tonight. The sun is setting. We'll have to find something fast. There, there are no campgrounds in this area. Uh, There's some RV places in, in camp, regular campgrounds, commercial campgrounds in Chinook and Haver, Montana, which are very nearby, like Haver's about 30 miles from here, 35 miles. Chinook is about 15 miles. We'll have to go look around. <laughs> well, here in Montana, there are a lot of things to see and there are a lot of stories to be told. From Yellowstone to Glacier National Park, to the prairie, to the ghost towns, the gold rush era, a lot of places to camp, a lot of national parks, a lot of uh, national forest. Boy, there's a lot of national forest in Montana. Take a look at a map and you'll see. We encourage you to come out and enjoy it, enjoy it with us. Yep, come on out. You betcha. Hey, you know what to do. Like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you around.